All right, check, 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 everybody check. enjoy lunch. Everybody got that like blood sugar curve just kind of like starting to settle out a little bit or is everybody like a little bit tired? No, everybody's good? Raise your hand if you're, if you're totally good. All right, that works. So Martin is gonna give us a demonstration about real world graphing. I mean, Python and GraphQL don't always go in the same sentence, so this should be really interesting. So please give a nice warm hand of applause for Marcin. Thanks, thanks everyone. Um, yeah, so uh, hello everyone. It's really nice to be here. I want to thank Jonathan for inviting me to this uh, event. It's like, so far it's been really amazing, this GraphQL track, so I hope you'll enjoy this presentation as well. So basically we will talk about building GraphQL servers in Python a little bit uh, and with uh, the Graphene framework which is currently the most popular GraphQL framework for Python. Uh, so a few words about me. Uh, I am Marcin and I come from Wrocław uh, which is a city in Poland and I work as a Python developer um, for the last five years and also for the last two years I've been working as a lead developer at a project called, called Sailor, which we are building at Mirumi, um, like actually for, for the last five years as well. Uh, yeah, you can follow me on Twitter, uh, where I write some things about GraphQL and Python. Um, so yeah, so to give you a bit more context about how we use GraphQL, I want to tell you a bit more about Sailor, which is the project that I'm working on. Uh, so basically with this project, our journey with GraphQL has started about three years ago. So basically Sailor is an e-commerce platform. So you can think about it as, I don't know, Shopify uh, or Magento. But the difference between our platform and Shopify is that this is entirely open source. So, but we offer also cloud solutions, so if you want to build e-commerce, you can use our cloud. But if you want to host it yourself, because you want to own your data, or have control over the entire code base, then you can do that with Sailor as well. <clears throat> so it consists of a few parts. First of all, this is the management dashboard. So this is huge crude application built in React and TypeScript. It's powered by GraphQL API. It's quite similar to Shopify, I would say. It has a lot of these um, management sections like catalog, orders, customers, and stuff like this, where you basically, as a store owner, do the entire shop management. The other part is the public storefront. So again, this is also a single page app. It's built in React and TypeScript and it's powered by GraphQL. So this is the template of your store. You can take it for free from uh, GitHub and customize to your needs. That's just the basic template, but it does all the storefront functionality. So it has product catalog, it has collections, um, user profiles, checkout, um, payment gateways, integrations, and stuff, stuff like that. And at the core of this entire platform lies the GraphQL API. So um, to give you some um, understanding how this API, like of the size of the API, here are a few facts about it. So we have now about 50 queries, 200 mutations, and 500 types. Um, we have features like JWT authentication and permissions. Uh, we also have service accounts and webhooks that was added uh, recently. So basically service accounts are just like user accounts except you use them to communicate uh, with our API from external services. And webhooks are uh, to send events from Sailor to your services. So there is two-way communication available between uh, third-party integrations. And lastly, most of our um, queries support filtering, sorting, and search capabilities. It's all open source, as I said before. Um, you can find it on GitHub. And there is also a public demo. So if you want to try out these apps that you've seen before, like the dashboard and storefront, you can do that uh, if you go to pwa.sailor.io. There is also a link to a playground, which is the GraphQL Explorer, when, where you can see the API in action with some um, example data so you can see how our mutation looks like, 
how we solved filtering and stuff like that. Uh, all right, so it wasn't like that since the beginning. So because this entire project is a few years old already, at the beginning this was purely Django application. So if you are familiar with Django, uh, it's just a monolithic app where everything sits in the same repository most often. So you have backend code in your Python, uh, in Python, and you also have static HTML templates and views inside the same repository. So we had those two uh, front-end apps, but they were like built into the same monolith, monolithic code base. So it work, worked pretty well for many years, but like about two years ago, we decided to migrate to GraphQL and to headless architecture because like for two reasons. First of all, we wanted to use single page apps for our front-end because single page gives you better user experience with dynamic interface. And it's really hard to do it right with your HTML templates. So it's, it's much better to rebuild your front end entirely in React than have HTML templates and keep adding pieces of React here and there. It just doesn't work and doesn't scale. And the second reason was uh, to enable external services integrations. So now we have the API that can be used standalone. You don't need to use our front end apps if you just want to have the e-commerce functionality because you are building some service that need to support products or checkout, you can use the API itself. Uh, cool, so yeah, um, our project was built in Django and Python. So when we started uh, building GraphQL, there was only one framework available and it's, it's called Graphene, so it's still the most popular one. Uh, it uses code first approach so in, uh, there was one talk today that mentioned a few differences between code first and schema first approach. So graphene is code first, which means that um, we are writing Python code. And from, from this Python code, we generate schema. Um, yeah. Uh, graphene also has support for uh, popular web frameworks such as Django, Flask, and Tornado, but you can also use it uh, with pure Python, if, if that's your use case. Yeah, so it took us about one year to uh, like reach feature parity with our old system. And for the next year, we've been actually improving the API. So now I want to share a few lessons that we've learned from this transition to uh, headless architecture and GraphQL um, first system. So first of all, uh, we've learned that Graphene is pretty good uh, if you have existing Django code base. Um, like the approach that Graphene has lets you really rapidly build a uh, GraphQL API on top of that. So, yeah. First of all, I want to show you how uh, the ORM looks like in Django. So, I think it's pretty much the same in most languages. So, basically, this is how we represent our models in Django. Uh, that's obviously a very simple example, and in real life, there would be much more fields. So this is the user type. We have three fields, and uh, it's just a class, and in a simple and declarative manner, we are defining those fields. Um, yeah, and if we want to represent that in Graphene and in GraphQL, what do we do? So again, we are using classes. So basically, Graphene has this classed, class first approach, let's say. Um, a lot of things are solved by classes. So again, we are defining the user class, and there is this pattern in Django and Python of meta classes, which can like um, customize behavior of, of a class. In this case, we are telling the user class that it needs to use the model, uh, the user model from our ORM, and only with like this one line tells Graphene that all fields from the user model should be uh, recreated in this user type in GraphQL. And here we can specify if we want to limit um, or only include some of those fields. So also in one of those talks before it was mentioned that, or maybe it was a question from, from the audience that it's not a good idea to always um, like represent all your uh, database fields in a GraphQL type. 
But in some cases you want to do that, maybe you don't want to expose all fields, but here you can in a very easy way uh, define which fields you want to include. And in our case, you've seen this dashboard application, it's just basically a huge crude app and basically we want to expose most of the database fields in, in our case. Um, in, so this is how we uh, bind this uh, user type to our um, queries. Basically, again, we are building a query class. Um, then we have the users field and simple function which basically talks to our uh, database using Django ORM to get all users. And as a result of this, um, like having those two classes, we end up with this piece of schema. Uh, so as you can see, we have those three fields that we had in our model. Uh, types are inferred, so if we, have, we, if we had date time field in Django, we have date time field here. Uh, also this um, lowercase with underscores naming conve convention from Python was translated to camel case, which is used in Graphene, sorry, in GraphQL. Um, yeah, so that's how it looks like when you want to build queries. And when we were doing that, we already had a lot of models and we found out that this approach is very effective if you have an existing code base. Um, some resolvers are generated by default, but you still have control over, over them. So if you want to customize behavior of particular resolver, you can simply override one function to do that. And lastly, um, there is similar approach in Graphene and Django of this declarative and class-based type of style of programming which makes it very easy to start working uh, with when you are experienced Django developer. So we've seen how we build queries and what about mutations. So it turns out that mutations are a bit harder. Uh, so let's see why. So this is an example um, mutation in Graphene. Again, this is just a class. In our case, like this is e-commerce API, so we want to have functionality like creating products. So this is a simple example of uh, mutation that creates products. So what's going on here? Um, so first we have uh, input definition. So this is data that comes to our mutation. So this is some product input type. We can assume that it has all the fields necessary to create a product such as name, description, price, etc. Here is output of our mutation. So we basically return a new product and this is the resolver. So this is the mutate function and in here we put all our business logic that needs to be executed when the uh, mutation is called. In this very simple example we just put all data incoming from our input to the model and we save that into the database. That's a very simple example only to show you how it looks like in Graphene but in real life, there are a few problems with this implementation. So first of all, um, there is no input data validation. Like in the real world, you need to uh, validate your input somehow because you have some business rules. Um, there are some, you know, a lot, of, a lot of cases when you want to compare your fields in your input to make sure that they are, um, that they are right. So whenever there is any validation error or there is any, actually any error, there is no way to return them in a unified manner in Graphene. So it's up to us how we solve this, this problem. And lastly, if you have a lot of mutations like this um, and you need to support these features, you end up with uh, a lot of duplicated code which uh, we don't want to have in our code base. So what can we do about this? So in Graphene there is um, like we need we needed to develop our own solutions for that and fortunately because everything in graphene and django is class based we can build some abstractions based on classes that help us to solve these problems so first of all um, i want to show you how we solve this issue with unified errors so it may seem a bit complex at the first glance but we don't have to analyze everything i just want to show you the idea uh, behind this abstraction so um, first thing we did here, uh, we basically added our own resolver for that mutation, which is called perform mutation. Um, and in the default uh, resolver, which is called mutate, we are actually calling our 
our uh, resolver. And if you can, like, you can see that there is this try accept block, which basically looks for any errors that happen during execution of, of our resolver. Uh, we also have this errors field at the top. So because this is an abstract class, if we build any other mutation based on this one, this errors field will be included in every other mutation that we have. And lastly, inside this mutate function, if there is any error raised by our Python code, uh, we have a tiny little function that converts those Python errors to this error type that we have in GraphQL. So this gives us unified error structure across all mutations in our code base. So quick example, uh, we have the product create mutation, which takes name and SKU. SKU is stock keeping unit, so in e-commerce you, you use that to identify the particular products that you are selling. And in the body of the mutation, we, are, uh, we want to get errors. So as you can see, every error consists of three fields, field, message, and code. And the response might look like this. Uh, so basically we get the information that the field that failed is skew. We have a message which is like, this mes message is not intended to be displayed in the UI. It's rather for the developer and for UI we have this code which says unique. So we have a bunch of validation codes like this. They are all enums so frontend can know in advance what types can happen during execution of that mutation. And based on that they can render proper message that this field is supposed to be unique and this validation failed. So I also said that uh, we have a lot of uh, crude mutations and when you are building them you will quickly notice that they all follow the same pattern. So basically uh, you want to clean your input data, you want to create a new model, model instance from this data, again do some validation and lastly save that into the database. So it's again and again the same pattern. And we have a little abstraction for that as well. It's called model mutation. So I've skipped implementation because it's like kind of complex here. So um, you can go to our GitHub to see how it works. But um, assuming that everything works nice, we can implement the same mutation in those few lines of code, which like everything happens under the hood. So if you have a lot of mutations like this, it's, it's very easy. Yeah, so we, again, we are using this meta class convention to tell this mutation that it needs to use the product uh, model to create a new product instance and validate it. Uh, okay, so we've talked about um, queries, mutations, but what about subscriptions in Graphene? So it turns out that if you are using Django, um, there is no native support for subscriptions. Uh, so the, the biggest problem with that, with Django, is that like it's great framework, but it's a f like I don't know, 10 or 15 years old, old already, and it was designed for this classic request-response pattern. Uh, and as we know, modern apps, web apps, are a little bit different. Um, yeah. So so the biggest issue with Django is that it's internally synchronous, so it doesn't support async requests. So it's like by default, you cannot have WebSockets in Django. You need to add some another libraries and workarounds to support that. And Graphene itself does support subscriptions, but not if you are using it with Django. So there is one uh, project called Django Channels, uh, which basically wraps your entire um, Django server with um, another server that is capable of handling async requests. But still, things like database access are synchronous, so you need to use decorators, decorators like this one, database sync to async, in order to have access to the database. I haven't used that uh, EAST myself, but um, I'm sure it adds some complexity to your existing code base. Um, so yeah, so it's, it's basically not native, but it is uh, possible somehow to, to achieve. But again, it requires third-party libraries, which is kind of problematic in projects like, like this one. Uh, and this brings us to the uh, last lesson about additional libraries. So actually in Graphene, like the basic features are implemented, but if you start 
using it and building fully fleshed API, you will quickly discover that some things that are implemented in other servers like Apollo server are missing. So for example, JWT authentication and permissions are not in Graphene by default. Uh, but there is one library which enables that. There is no support for Apollo Federation, which is a little bit new thing, but it's becoming the new standard of um, like how to combine different APIs, uh, GraphQL APIs. So there is one project that adds that to Graphene, but it's not there in, uh, by, by default. There is also no support for file upload. And some features are not implemented at all, so I haven't found any libraries that would add that to our project. So for example, query cost analysis is not supported at all. Uh, so there is no way to prevent our API from uh, malicious queries. <sighs> yeah, so like as, like as I said, there are some libraries, but you, like in some cases you, you cannot trust them, let's say, because some of those libraries are very small projects maintained by, you know, one person, and you will never know if they will be maintained or not. So ideally you would like to have these features in your framework. So uh, these are the four lessons that we've learned. Um, the summary is that we've managed to build a pretty big API with Graphene, that, and we're, we are really happy with our code base. So everything works, uh, although there are some problems with this project. So you may be asking yourself, uh, why do we actually use Python? Why do we actually use Django and Graphene? Since there are some like better tools, maybe Apollo Server, which is probably the best GraphQL server right now. So the answer for us, for my team, is very simple. We basically love Python. Um, yeah, and we've been using Python for like, since beginnings of the company, so for about 10 years now. We have very experienced team in Python, and uh, like entire code base that in, in Sailor was already built in Python, so as you know, it's it's big cost to re rebuild your code base into a completely different stack. But also, like um, we think that Python is very readable language, and it helps us a lot to maintain very clean code base. Uh, you also he have very nice community in Python, and instead of dropping this language at all, um, yeah. And also, modern Python is already asynchronous, so this is an uh, example resol resolver in another GraphQL library in. Uh, in Python that um, I will talk about in a minute. So you have first-class async await support in Python already. So it's all coming to Python. It's, it's developing really well. So uh, we decided that it's better to invest some more time into Python ecosystem and have these features, features in Python as well. Uh, yeah, you can also see the growth of Python, like recent growth. Um, compared to other languages, it's becoming really the most popular programming language nowadays. So it makes us, it ensures us that it's really worth um, of, of spending more time on, on that uh, thing. So our experiences with Graphene led us to look for some other solutions, and that's the, that's the last thing I want to show you. It's a GraphQL server that my company is building. It's Ariadne, um, and it's basically inspired by Apollo Server. Um, so we want to, like, we want to have a framework that is maintained by a company that is constantly developed, and it gets all the features. And that's what we do with, with, with Ariadne. So this is kind of experiment, but it's we are using it already in few projects in production as well. Um, so if you are interested in, if you are doing Python in GraphQL make sure to check it out. And that's all I have for you. Uh, thanks for attending my talk. If you have any questions about uh, GraphQL in Python or this e-commerce API that I've showed, feel free to uh, find me after the talk. Thanks. That was a great talk. And it goes back to the very first talk that we had mentioned, that it's a technology agnostic uh, specification, so even in Python. Are there any questions about that talk? Any questions?
our library, like uh, query cost analysis. Um, did you think of um, like creating your own? Uh, because most of the time, uh, it's just like a, almost a copy paste of uh, the library from another language. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Uh, we have some uh, proof of concept version in Ariadne of query cost analysis. So it's not there yet, but we will probably provide that as well. And I was also thinking about actually opening a pull request to Graphene because, you know, like query cost analysis is just a bunch of functions probably, and it could be easily moved to Graphene as well. So maybe it will happen in, in the future. Thank you. Any other questions? <laughs>